Shakti, welcome on in. That went through. I heard it. Everyone else hear it? <laughs> Both of them? So I think I may have figured it out. I just have to... Jeffrey Rush won an Academy Award for his role. It's a brilliant pianist in the film. Okay, well, yeah. But yeah, I think I might have them working. I did have to use it as desktop audio. But that makes me hear double, but you guys at least get to hear it. Hey, Taka. How you doing? just because I like them. Now, I know blurb works. Blurb hasn't been a problem. It's just sound alerts has been a problem. No, I'm kind of curious if this is going to work, too. Maybe. Where's my hat? Oh, come on. I know I had that turned on. No, it's not connected. Duh. Yes, allow, please. Thank you. Okay. Oh, well, this is turned off. It's craziness. Should be on now. Maybe things loaded again. Come on, I want my top hat. It's rather fancy. I don't know why I did it, but someone said they pictured me in a top hat, so I thought I would use it. But we are doing fairy tales tonight, so 
classiness is sometimes qualified. And we are doing a new old book. New for our streams, but the fairy tales in it. Uh, well, the book itself is technically a hundred years old. Not my copy. I wish I had the hundred year old copy, but it would also be toxic. So <laughs> I can't have that version. So how's everyone else's week then? I'm shaking my drink. I'm drinking Halo Hydrate Caramel Latte out of a Gamer Sups Kanuchi Shaker. <laughs> Hashtag not sponsored. I swear it's the only gamer subs cup that isn't a large breasted woman. This one's actually fairly petite. Seems to be a little high on the screen. Let me fix that. So oh, it was on that screen. Uh okay. That should be a little bit more truer to height. Okay. Ooh, did I can't remember if I got the right image up for the reading it. Let me look. Oh yes, it is set up already. Good, good, good. So anyway, the book we're going to start tonight is the Yellow Fairy Book. Because there's lots of fairy books and we're on, we finished up green last week and yellow comes after green. At least as far as Andrew Lang. Because the first one was blue, then it went red, then green. Now we're going yellow. I think the next one's pink. But we'll get to that when we get to it. I'm going to play another sound alert. Maybe. Hold on. I'd say go make some popcorn. Uh, get something to drink or anything like that. Is we do a lot of fairy tales. Oop. Anniversary update. I don't care about the anniversary update for sound alerts. I do care if they work. Because there'll be all sorts of disruptions for my reading. Maybe. Is it going to play? Maybe. And of course, it's on a timer. Hmm. Well, I'll get a jump scare here eventually. Maybe. Oh, well, the panel one's not wanting to work. Just the points one. Anyway, yeah. We are doing the Yellow Fairy book. And I was thinking about it. These books were being written about the same time that the Wizard of Oz books were. And uh, Frank Obama, who was doing the Wizard of Oz books, did not like fairy tales having morals. He said, that's what school is for. Kids need fuds of fancy. They don't need anything to learn lessons from. <laughs> and this one actually starts out with an argument between this author and the folklore societies because they were updating the language and making them for modern children. I'm going to read the preface anyway, because honestly I think it's hilarious that they did this. And I apologize for any weird sounds, because I do have my window open. Someday, if and when I get a new setup, I'll move into another room and do the streaming from there, but for now I'm still literally reading this in my living room because I can and that's where my laptop desk is but anyway the preface was written by the author of this book 
I think it's hilarious that he kind of takes digs against people. It finally played. <laughs> Did you hear the jump scare? Because I'm hoping it played out there too. <laughs> I triggered that like two minutes ago and it took that long for it to play. So delayed jump scare, but at least it works. It'll be interesting to see if I can survive jump scares while trying to read fairy tales. <clears throat> They're not going to be recorded because I have them going to the non-VOD track. But yeah. Anyway. <clears throat> the Yellow Fairy Book Preface The editor thinks that children will readily forgive him for publishing another fairy book. We've had the red, blue, the red, the green, and here is the yellow. If children are pleased, and they are so kind as to say that they are pleased, the editor does not care very much what other people may say. Now, there is one gentleman who seems to think that it is not quite right to print so many fairy tales with pictures and to publish them in red and green and blue covers. He is named Mr. G. Lawrence Gome and is the president of the learned body called the Folklore Society. Once a year, he makes his address to his subjects, of whom the editor is one, and Mr. Joseph Jacobs, who has published many delightful fairy tales with pretty pictures, is another... Fancy, then, the dismay of Mr. Jacobs and of the editor when they heard that their president say that he did not think it very nice in them to publish fairy books, above all, green, red, and blue fairy books. They said that they did not see any harm in it and that they were ready to put themselves on their country and be tried by a jury of children. And indeed, they still see no harm in what they have done. Nay, like Father William and the poet, they are ready to do it again and again. Where's the harm? The truth is that the Folkler Society, made up the most clever, learned, and beautiful men and women in the country, is fond of studying the history and geography of fairyland. This is contained in very old tales, such as country people. These people are thought to know the most about fairyland and its inhabitants, but in the yellow fairy book and the rest are many tales by persons who are neither savages nor rustics, such as Madame de Olenway and Herr Hans Christian Andersen. The Folklore Society, or its president, say that their tales are not so true as the rest, and should not be published with the rest. But we say that all stories which are pleasant to read are quite true enough for us. So here they are, with pictures by Mr. Ford, and we do not think that either the pictures or the stories are likely to mislead children. As to whether there are really any fairies or not, that is a difficult question. Professor Huxley thinks that there are none. The editor never saw any himself, but he knows several people who have seen them, in the Highlands, or heard their music. If ever you are in the Loch Ber, go to the Fairy Hill and you may hear the music yourself. As grown-up people have done, but you must go on a fine day. Again, if there are really no fairies, why do people believe in them all over the world? The ancient Greeks believed, so did the old Egyptians, and the Hindus, and the Indians, and it is likely, if there are no fairies, that so many different peoples would have seen or heard them. The Reverend Mr. Baring Gold saw several fairies when he was a boy, and was traveling in the land of the Troubadours. For these reasons, the editor thinks that there are certainly fairies, but they never do anyone any harm, and, in England, they have been frightened away by the smoke and schoolmasters. As to giants, they have died out, 
but real dwarves are common in the forests of Africa. Probably a good many stories not perfectly true have been told about fairies, but such stories have also been told about Napoleon, Claverhouse, Julius Caesar, and Joan of Arc, all of whom certainly existed. A wise child will, therefore, remember that if he grows up and becomes a member of the Folklore Society, all the tales in this book were not offered to him as absolutely truthful, but were printed merely for his entertainment. The exact facts he can learn later, or he can leave them alone. There are Russian, German, French, Icelandic, American Indian, and other stories here. They were translated by Miss Shape, Miss Alma, and Miss Thera Alanine, Miss Seller, and Mr. Craigie. He did the Icelandic tales. Miss Blackley, Mrs. Dent, and Mrs. Lang. But the American Indian stories are copied from English versions published by the Smithsonian Bureau of Entomology in America. Mr. Ford did the pictures. And it is hoped that children will find the book not less pleasing than those which have already been submitted to their consideration. The editor cannot say goodbye without advising them as they pursue their studies to read The Rose and the Ring by the late Mr. Thackeray with pictures by the author. This book he thinks quite indispensable in every child's library, and parents should be urged to purchase it at the first opportunity, as without it, no education is complete. A. Lang. <laughs> See what I mean about that? It's like, screw you, Folglorus. We're going to read the fairy tales we want to read. <laughs> So basically, they're just saying, it doesn't have to be the local authors doing it. Anyone can write fairy tales, which is good because I'm writing them. But still, the fact that he took three pages of the front of his fourth book of fairy tales to tell off the Folklore Society. You gotta love the guy. <laughs> Anyway, the first story for tonight is actually one that's going to be in my second book that I'm working on. No, wait. This is my first one. Yeah. I wonder if I can use their art. I mean, it'd be public domain, I suppose. It looks better than the stuff I've drawn. But anyway, <clears throat> our first actual story for this wonderful Friday night of fairy tales. The Cat and the Mouse in Partnership. A cat had made acquaintance with the mouse, and had spoken so much of the great love and friendship she felt for her, that at last the mouse consented to live in the same house with her, and to share in the housekeeping. But we must provide for winter, or else all we shall suffer, said the cat. You, little mouse, cannot venture everywhere in case you run into a last trap. The good counsel was followed, and a little pot of fat was bought. But they did not know where to put it. At length, after long consultation, the cat said, I know of no place where it would be better put than in the church. No one will trouble to take it away from there. We will hide it in a corner, and we won't touch it till we are in want. So the little pot was placed in safety, but it was not long before the cat had a great longing for it, and said to the mouse, I want to tell you, little mouse, that my cousin had a little son, white with brown spots, and she wants me to be the godmother to it. Let me go out today, and you can take care of the house alone. Yes, certainly, replied the mouse. And when you eat anything good, think of me. I should very much like a drop of red christening wine. <coughs> <clears throat> but it was all untrue. The cat had no cousin and had not been asked to be a godmother. 
She went straight to the church and slunk into the little pot of fat and began to lick it, and licked the top off. Then she took a walk on the roofs of the town and looked at the view, stretched herself out in the sun, and licked her lips whenever she thought of the little pot of fat. As soon as it was evening, she went home again. Ah, here you are again, said the mouse. You must certainly have had an enjoyable day. It went off very well, replied the cat. What was the child's name? asked the mouse. Top off, said the cat dryly. Top off, echoed the mouse. It is indeed a wonderful and curious name. Is it in your family? What is odd about it? said the cat. It is not worse than bread thief, as your godchild is called. Not long after this, another great longing came over the cat, and she said to the mouse, You must be kind enough to look after the house alone, for I've been asked for a second time to stand godmother, and as this child has a white ring around its neck, I cannot refuse. The kind mouse agreed, but the cat slunk under the town wall to the church and ate up half of the pot of fat. Nothing tastes better, she said, than what one eats by oneself. And she was very much pleased with her day's work. When she came home, the mouse asked, What is this child called? Um, half gone answered the cat. Half gone? What a name! I've never heard it in my life! I don't believe it's in the calendar! As soon as the cat's mouth began to water once more after licking her business, All good things come in three, she said to the mouse. I have again to stand godmother. The child is quite black and has very white paws, but not a single white hair on its body. This only happens once in two years, so you will let me go out? Top off, half gone, repeated the mouse. They're such curious names, they make me very thoughtful. Oh, you can sit at home in your dark grey coat and your long tail, said the cat, and you get fanciful. That comes of not going out in one day. The mouse had a good cleaning out while the cat was gone, and made the house tidy, but the greedy cat ate the fat up every bit. When it is all gone, one can be at rest, she said to herself. And at night she came home sleek and satisfied. The mouse asked at once after the third child's name, it won't please you any better, said the cat. He was called Clean Gone. Clean Gone, repeated the mouse. I do not believe that name has been printed in any of the others. Clean Gone, what does it mean? She shook her head and curled herself up and went to sleep. From this time on, no one asked the cat to stand grandmother. And when the winter came and there was nothing to be got outside, the mouse remembered their provision and said, Come, cat, we will go to our pot of fat which we have stored away. It will taste very good. Yes, indeed, answered the cat. It will taste as good to you as if you stretched your thin tongue out of the window. And they started off, and when they reached it, they found the pot in its place but quite empty. Ah, said the mouse. Now I know what has happened. It has all come out. You are the true friend to me. You have eaten it all and it's, you stood godmother. First the top off, then the half of it gone. Then, will you be quiet? Screamed the cat. Another word and I will eat you up. Clean gun! was already on the poor mouse's tongue, and scarcely was it out when the cat made a spring at her, seized her, and swallowed her. You see, that is the way of the world.
<laughs> hey, tired tiny turtle. How you doing? animation stuff is fun. Why the hell did it shout ass glad? <laughs> so ass glad hasn't streamed for a week. Why did it go to him? Oh well. At least it did talk us. <laughs> oh, pretty good. Finally. Getting settled in for the night, so I figured I'd do fairy tales. Try this. What? Why did it do mad? That's weird. Hell, are you stoned? Let's <laughs> see which Pokemon came up. The shoutouts are going through uh, an app called Frosty Tools. Well, not an app, it's a page. But you can tell it to do different styles of shoutouts. It's been interesting. Ready for the next story? Second story for this wonderful Friday Night of Fairy Tales. The Six Swans. A king was once hunting in a great wood, and he had hunted the game so eagerly that none of his courtiers could follow him. When evening came, he stood still and looked around him, and he saw that he had gotten himself quite lost. He sought a way out, but could find none. Then he saw an old woman with a shaking head coming towards him, but she was a witch. Good woman, he said to her, can you not show me the way out of the wood? Oh, certainly, Sir King, she replied. I can quite well do that, but on one condition, which if you do not fulfill, you will never get out of the wood and you will die of hunger. Oh, what is the condition? asked the king. Oh, I have a daughter, said the old woman, who is so beautiful that she is not the equal in the world, and is well fitted to be your wife. If you make her your queen, I will show you the way out of the wood. 
The king, in his anguish of mind, consented, and the old woman led him to her little house where her daughter was sitting by the fire. She received the king as if she were expecting him, and he saw that she was certainly very beautiful. But she did not please him, and he could not look at her without a secret feeling of horror. As soon as he had lifted the maiden onto his horse, the old woman showed him the way, and the king reached his palace, where the wedding was celebrated. <clears throat> well... <clears throat> The king had already been married once, and had by his first wife seven children, six boys and one girl, whom he loved more than anything in the world, and now, because he was afraid that their stepmother might not treat them as well, or might do them harm, he put them in a lonely castle that stood in the middle of the wood. It lay so hidden that the way to it was so hard to find, that... He himself could not find it if it had not been for a wise woman who gave him a real thread which he possessed, and had a marvelous property. When he threw it before him, it unwound himself and showed him the way. But the king went so often to see his dear children that the queen was offended by his absence. She grew curious and wanted to know what he had to do quite alone in the wood. So she gave his servants a great deal of money, and they betrayed the secret to her, and also told her of the real which alone could point the way out. She had no rest till she had found out where the king guarded the real, and then she made some little white shirts, and she had learned from her witch mother, and sewed an enchantment in each of them. When the king had ridden off, she took the white shirts and went into the wood, and the real showed her the way. Children who saw someone coming in the distance thought it was the dear father coming to them, and sprang to meet him very joyfully. Then she threw over each one a little shirt, which, when it had touched their bodies, changed them into swans, and they flew away over the forest. The queen went home quite satisfied and thought she had got rid of her stepchildren. But the girl had not run out to meet her with her brothers, and she knew nothing of her. The next day the king went to visit his children, but he found no one but the girl. Where are your brothers? asked the king. Alas, father, she answered, they have gone away and left me all alone. And she told him that, looking out of her little window, she had seen her brothers flying over the wood in the shape of swans. And she showed him the feathers which they had let fall to the yard, and which she had collected. The king mourned, but he did not think that the queen had done the wicked deed. And as he was afraid of the maiden, who would also be taken from him, he wanted to take her with him. But she was afraid of the stepmother and begged the king to let her stay just one more night in the castle in the wood. The poor maiden thought, My home is no longer here. I will go and seek my brothers. And when night came, she fled away into the forest. She ran all through the night and the next day till she could go no further from weariness. Then she saw a little hut and went in and found a room with six little beds. She was afraid to lie down on one, so she crept under one of them and lay on the hard floor, and was going to spend the night there. But when the sun set, she had heard a noise, and saw six swans flying in the window. They stood on the floor and blew at each other, and blew off all their feathers, and their swan skin came off like a shirt. Then the maiden recognized her brothers, and overjoyed she crept out from under the bed. Her brothers were not less delighted than she to see their little sister again, and their joy oh, it did not last long. You cannot stay here, they said to her. This is a den of robbers. If they come here and find you, they will kill you. Could you not protect me? asked the little sister. No, they answered. 
for we can only lay aside our swan skins for a quarter of an hour every evening. For this, we regain our human forms, but then we are changed into swans again. Then the little sister cried and said, <laughs> Can you be freed? Oh no, they said. The conditions are too hard. You must not speak or laugh for six years. I must make in that time six shirts for us out of star flowers. If a single word comes out of your mouth, all the labor will be in vain. And when the brothers had said this, their quarter of an hour was up. And it came to an end, and they flew away out of the window with swans. But the maiden had determined to free her brothers, even if it should cost her her own life. She left out of the hut and went to the forest and climbed a tree and spent the night there. The next morning she went out and collected star flowers and began to sew. She could speak to no one, and she had no wish to laugh, so she sat there, looking only at her work. When she had lived there some time, it happened that the king of the country was hunting in the forest, and his hunters came to the tree on which the maiden sat. They called to her and said, Who are you? But she gave no answer. Come down to us, they said. We will do you no harm. But she shook her head silently. As they pressed her further with questions, they threw them the golden chain from her neck. But they did not leave off. Then she threw them her girdle. And when this was of no use, her garters. And then her dress. The huntsman would not leave her alone, but climbed the tree, lifted the maiden down, and led her to the king. The king asked, Who are you, and what are you doing up in a tree? But she answered nothing. He asked her in all the languages he knew, but she remained as dumb as a fish. Because she was so beautiful, however, the king's heart was touched, and he was seized with a great love for her. He wrapped her up in his cloak and placed her before him on his horse and brought her to his castle. There he had her dressed in rich clothes, and her beauty shone as out as bright as day, but not a word could be drawn from her. He set her by the ta his side at the table, and modest ways and behavior pleased him so much that he said, I will marry this maiden, and none other in the world. And after some days, he married her. But the king had a wicked mother who was displeased with this marriage, and said wicked things of the young queen. Who knows who this girl is, she said. She cannot speak, and is not worthy of a king. After a year, when the queen had had her first child, the old mother took it away from her. And then she went to the king and said that the queen had killed it. The king would not believe it and would not allow any harm to be done to her. But she sat quietly sewing the shirts and troubling herself about nothing. The next time she had a child, the wicked mother did the same thing. But the king could not make up his mind to believe her. He said, oh, she's too sweet and to do such a good thing like that. If she were not dumb and could defend herself, her innocence would be proven. But when the third child was taken away and the queen was again accused and could not utter a word in her own defense, the king was obliged to give her over to the law, which decreed that she must be burnt to death. When the day came on which the sentence was to be executed, it was the last day of the six years in which she must not speak or laugh. And now she had freed her dear brothers from the power of the enchantment. The six shirts were done. There was only a uh, left sleeve missing from the last one. When she was led to the stake, she laid the shirt on her arms. And as she stood on the pile and the fire was about to be lighted, she looked around her and saw six swans flying through the air. Then she knew that her release was at hand, and her heart danced for joy. The swans fluttered around her and hovered low that she could throw the shirts over them. When they had touched them, the swan skins fell off, and her brothers stood before her, living well and beautiful. Mostly. 
Only the youngest had the swan's wing instead of the arm. They embraced and kissed each other, and the queen went to the king, who was standing by with great astonishment, and began to speak to him, saying, Dearest husband, now I can speak and tell you openly that I am innocent, have been falsely accused. She told him of the old woman's deceit, and how she had taken the three children away and hidden them. Then they were fetched, to the great joy of the king, and the wicked mother came to no good end. But the king and the queen, with her six brothers, lived many years in happiness and peace. <clears throat> if you read my book or listened to enough of the stories that I've told, what is it with fairy tale kings finding naked maidens in the woods and insisting on marrying them? <laughs> and she was up in the tree, stripping and throwing her clothes at the guards. And after she was bare, they came up and took her down. I would say, in the words of Mel Brooks, it's good to be the king. <laughs> <clears throat> That's from History of the World, Part 1. And he's playing King Louis of France. But anyway. <laughs> hmm. We would have to wonder about fairy tale kings. Not only do they get lost hunting in the woods, but then they find naked maidens and bring them home. I mean, it's not safe. How do you know she's not a dryad? Oh, well. Uh, this is actually a lot more polite version of the story, because in one of the versions I have read, um, the mother-in-law was accusing her of eating the children. <laughs> And she would purposely, you know, prick the baby's finger and smear the blood on the mother's lips. And she couldn't say anything against it. So, yeah. This is a lot nicer version than one of the other ones I've read. Of course, there was another version that she um, accused her of eating them, then threw the babies in a snake pit, and the you know, snakes... No, never harmed the babies. But uh, when the queen was found out, oh, well, stepmother was found out, the babies were rescued and she was thrown in the snake pit. And the snakes were not so nice. So yeah, fairy tales can be gruesome. And if I find the ones that aren't censored, I don't censor it either. <laughs> the ones in my book aren't censored because I want the stories told. Yeah. Fairy tales can be very grim, and it's probably how the term got related to them after the Brothers Grimm wrote the story tales. Excuse me. Let's see, this one... Ooh, Netherlands. Yeah. <clears throat> so, six ones. Our <laughs> next, possibly slightly more graphic fairy tale for the net evening. Because it's about a dragon. And dragons tend to get graphic. <clears throat> the Dragon of the North. Very long ago, an old people have told me there lived a terrible monster who came out of the North and laid waste whole tracts of the country, devouring both men and beasts. And this monster was so destructive that it is feared that unless help came, no living creature would be left on the face of the earth. It had a body like an ox, and legs like a frog. 
two short front legs and two long ones behind. Besides that, it had a tail of a serpent, ten fathoms in length. When it moved, it jumped like a frog, and with every spring it covered half a mile of ground. Fortunately, its habit was to remain for several years in the same place, and not to move till the whole neighborhood was eaten up. Nothing could hunt it, because its whole body was covered with scales, which were harder than stone or metal, and its two great eyes shone by night and even by day, like the brightest lamps, and anyone who had the ill luck to look into those eyes became bewitched, and was obliged to rush of its own accord into the monster's jaws. In this way, the dragon was able to feed upon both men and beasts, without the least trouble to itself, as it needed not to move from the spot where it was lying. All the neighboring kings had offered rich rewards to anyone who should destroy the monster, either by force or enchantment, and many had tried their luck, but all had failed miserably. Once a great forest in which the dragon lay had been set on fire. The forest was burnt down, but the fire did not do the monster the least harm. However, there was a tradition amongst the wise men of the country that the dragon might be overcome by one who possessed King Solomon's signet ring, upon which the secret writing was engraved. This inscription would enable anyone who was wise enough to interpret it to find out how the dragon could be destroyed. Only, no one knew where the ring was hidden, nor was there any sorcerer or learned man to be found who would be able to explain the transcription. At last, a young man with a good heart and plenty of courage set out to search for the ring. He took his way toward the rising sun, because he knew that all the wisdom of old times comes from the east. After some years, he met with a famous eastern magician and asked for his advice in the matter. The magician answered, <laughs> Mortal men have but little wisdom and can give you no help. But the birds of the air would be better guides to you if you could learn their language. I can help you to understand it if you stay with me for a few days. The youth thankfully accepted the magician's offer and said, I cannot now offer you any reward for your kindness, but should my undertaking succeed, your trouble shall be paid richly. Then the magician brewed a powerful potion of nine sorts of herbs, which he had gathered himself, all alone by moonlight, and he gave the youth nine spoonfuls of it daily for three days, which made him able to understand the language of birds. Upon parting, the magician said to him, If you have a fine Solomon's ring and get possession of it, then come back to me, that I may explain the inscription in the ring to you, for there is no one else in the world who can do this. From that time, the youth never felt lonely as he walked along. He always had company, because he understood the language of birds. And in this way, he learned many things which were mere human knowledge could never have taught him. But time went on, and he heard nothing about the ring. It happened one evening, when he was hot and tired of walking, that he sat down under a tree in the forest to eat his supper, and he saw two gaily plumed birds that were strange to him, sitting at the top of a tree, talking to one another about him. The first bird said, I know that this wandering fool under the tree there. He has come far without finding what he seeks. He is trying to find King Solomon's lost ring. The other bird answered, you will have to seek help from the witch maiden, who will, who will doubtless be able to put him right on the right track. If she has not got the ring herself, she knows well enough who has it. But where is he to find the witch maiden? said the first bird. She has not settled dwelling. She is here today and gone tomorrow. He might as well try to catch the wind. The other replied, I do not certainly know, but she is at 
present, but in three nights from now she will come to the spring to wash her face, as she does every month when the moon is full, in order that she may never grow old nor wrinkled, but may always keep the bloom of youth. Well, said the first bird, the spring is not far from here. Shall we go and see how it is she does it? Willingly, if you like, said the other. The youth immediately resolved to follow the birds to the spring. Only two things made him uneasy. First, lest he might be asleep when the birds went, and secondly, lest he might lose sight of them, since he had not wings to carry him along so swiftly. He was too tired to keep awake all night, yet his anxiety prevented him from sleeping soundly. And when, with the earliest dawn, he looked up to the treetop, he was glad to see his feathered companions still asleep with their heads under their wings. So he ate breakfast and waited until the birds should start, but they did not leave the place all day. They hopped about from tree to tree to another looking for food, and all day long until evening when they went back to their old perch to sleep. The next day the same thing happened. But on the third morning, one bird said to the other, Today we must go to the spring to see the witch maiden wash her face. They remained on the tree till noon. Then they flew away and went towards the south. The young man's heart beat less anxiety, lest he should lose sight of his guides. But he managed to keep the birds in view until they perched upon a tree. The young man ran after them until he was quite exhausted and out of breath. And after three short rests, the birds at length reached a small open space in the forest, on the edge of which they placed themselves in the top of a high tree. When the youth had overtaken them, he saw that there was a clear spring in the middle of the space. He sat down at the foot of the tree upon the birds were perched, and listened attentively to what they were saying to each other. Uh, the sun is not down yet, said the first bird. We must wait a while the moon rises and the maiden comes to the spring. Do you think she will see that young man sitting underneath the tree? Nothing is likely to escape her eyes, certainly not a young man, <laughs> said the other bird. Will the youth have sense not to let himself be caught in her toils? Oh, we will wait, said the first bird, and we will see how they get on together. The evening light had quite faded, and the full moon was already shining down upon the forest, when the young man heard a slight rustling sound. A few moments there came out of the forest a maiden, gliding over the grass so lightly that her feet scarcely seemed to touch the ground, and stood beside the spring. The youth could not turn away his eyes from the maiden, for he had never in his life seen a woman so beautiful. Without seeming to notice anything, she went to the spring, and looked up at the full moon, then knelt down, and bathed her face nine times. Then looked up at the moon again, and walked nine times around the well. And as she walked, she sang the song. <clears throat> Full-faced moon with light unshaded let my beauty ne'er be faded, never let my cheek grow pale. When the moon is waning nightly, may the maiden bloom more brightly, may your freshness never fail. Then she dried her face with her long hair, and was about to go away when her eye suddenly fell upon the spot where the young man was sitting, and she turned towards the tree. The youth rose and stood waiting. Then the maiden said, You ought to have heavy punishment because you have presumed to watch my secret doings in the moonlight. But I will forgive you this time, because you are a stranger and you know better. But you must tell me truly who you are, and how you came to this place where no mortal has ever set foot before. 
And the youth answered humbly, Forgive me, beautiful maiden, if I have unintentionally offended you. I chanced to come here after long wandering and found a good place to sleep under this tree. At your coming I did not know what to do, but I stayed where I was because I thought my silent watching could not defend you. The maiden answered kindly, Come and spend the night with us. You will sleep better on a pillow than on the damp moss. The youth hesitated a little, but presently he heard the birds saying from the top of the tree, Go away, she calls you, but take care to give no blood, or she will sell your soul. The youth went with her, and soon they reached a beautiful garden, where stood a splendid house, which glittered in the moonlight as if it were built all out of gold and silver. When the youth entered, he found many splendid chambers, each finer than the last. Hundreds of tapers burnt upon golden candlesticks and shed a light like the brightest day. At length they reached a chamber where a table was spread with the most costly of dishes. At the table were placed two chairs, one of silver, the other of gold. The maiden seated herself upon the golden chair and offered the silver one to her companion. They were served by maidens dressed in white, whose feet made no sound at all as they moved about, and not a word was spoken during the meal. Afterward, the youth and the witch maiden conversed pleasantly together until a woman dressed in red, came in to remind them that it was bedtime. The youth was now shown into another room, containing a silken bed with down cushions, where he slept delightfully. Yet he seemed to hear a voice near his bed which repeated to him, Remember to give no blood. Remember to give no blood. The next morning the maiden asked him whether he would not like to stay with her always in this beautiful place. As he did not answer immediately, she continued, You see how I always remain young and beautiful, and I'm under no one's orders, and can do just what I like, so that I never thought of marrying before. But from the moment I saw you, I took a fancy to you, so... If you agree, we might be married and might live together like princes, because I have great riches. The youth could not help being tempted with the beautiful maid's offer, understandably. But he remembered how the birds had called her a witch, and their warnings always sounded in his ears. Therefore he answered cautiously, um, Do not be angry, dear maiden. If I do not decide immediately on this important matter, give me a few days to consider before we come to an understanding. Why not? answered the maiden. Take some weeks to consider, if you like, and take counsel with your own heart. And to make the time pass pleasantly, she took the youth over every part of her beautiful dwelling and showed him all of her splendid treasures. But these treasures were all produced by enchantment, for the maiden could make anything she wished appear by the help of King Solomon's signet ring. Only none of these things remained fixed. They passed away with, like the wind without leaving a trace behind. But the youth did not know this. He th thought they were all real. One day the maiden took him into a secret chamber, where a little gold box was standing on a silver table. Pointing to the box, she said, Here is my greatest treasure, whose like is not to be found in the whole world. It is a precious gold ring. When you marry me, I will give you this ring as a marriage gift, and it will make you the happiest of mortal men. But in order that your love may last forever, you must give me for the ring three drops of blood from the little finger your left hand. When the youth heard these words, a cold shudder ran over him, for he remembered that his soul was at stake. He was cunning enough, however, to conceal his feelings and make no direct answer, but he only asked the maiden, as if carelessly, what was so remarkable about the ring. She answered, No mortal was able to entirely understand the power of this ring, because 
No one thoroughly understands the secret ring engraved on it. But even with my half-knowledge, I can work great wonders. If I put the ring on my little finger of my left hand, then I can fly like a bird through the air wherever I wish. If I put it on the third finger of my left hand, I am invisible. And I can see everything that passes around me, though no one can see me. If I put the ring upon my middle finger of my left hand, then neither fire nor water nor sharp object can hurt me. If I put it on the forefinger of my left hand, then I can help with produce whatever I wish. I can in a single moment build houses or anything I desire. Finally, as long as I wear the ring on my thumb of my left hand, that hand is so strong that it can break down rocks and walls. Besides these, the ring has other secret signs which, as I said, no one can understand. No doubt it contains secrets of great importance. The ring formerly belonged to King Solomon, the wisest of kings, during whose reign the wisest men lived. But it is not known whether the ring was ever made by mortal hands, and it is supposed that the angel gave it to the wise king. When the youth heard all this, he determined to try and get possession of the ring, though he did not quite believe in all its wonderful gifts. He wished the maiden would let him have it in his hand, but he did not dare ask her to do so, and after a while she put it back into the box. A few days after, they were again speaking of the magic ring, and the youth said, I do not think it's possible that the ring can have all those powers that you say it has. Then the maiden opened the box and took the ring out, and it glittered as she held it like the clearest sunbeam. She put it on the middle finger of her left hand and told the youth to take a knife and try as hard as he could to cut her with it, for he would not be able to hurt her. He was unwilling at first, but the maiden insisted. Then he tried, at first only in play, then seriously to strike her with a knife. But an invisible wall of iron seemed to be between them, and the maiden stood before him laughing and it hurt. Then she put the ring on her third finger, and in an instant she vanished from his eyes. Presently she, she was beside him again laughing, holding the ring between her fingers. Oh, do let me try, said the youth, whether I can do all these wonderful things. The maiden, suspecting no treachery, gave him the magic ring. The youth pretended to have forgotten what to do, and asked what finger he must put the ring on, so that no sharp weapon could hurt him. Oh, the middle finger of your left hand, the maiden answered, laughing. She took the knife and tried to strike the youth, and he even tried to cut himself with it, but found it impossible. Then he asked the maiden to show him how to split stones and rocks with the help of the ring. So she led him into a courtyard where stood a great boulder. Now, she said, put the ring upon the thumb of your left hand, and you will see how strong that hand has become. The youth did so, and found to his astonishment that with a single blow of his fist, the stone flew into a thousand pieces. Then the youth bethought him that he who has not used his luck when he has it is a fool, and that this was his chance, once lost, might never return. So, while they stood laughing at the shattered stone, he placed the ring, as if in play, upon the third finger of his left hand. No, said the maiden, you're invisible to me until you take the ring off again. But the youth had no mind to do that. On the contrary, he went further off and put the ring on the little finger of his left hand and soared into the air like a bird. When the maiden saw him flying away, she thought at first he was still in play and cried, Oh, come back, friend. Now you see how I've told you the truth. But the young man never came back. Then the maiden saw she was deceived and bitterly repented that she had never trusted him with the ring. The young man never halted in his flight until he reached the dwelling of the wise magician who had taught him the speech of birds. The magician was delighted to find that his search had been successful, 
and at once set to work to interpret the secret signs engraved on the ring. But it took him seven weeks to make them out clearly. Then he gave the youth the following instructions on how to overcome the Dragon of the North. You must cast an iron horse, which will have little wheels under each foot. You must also be armed with a spear two fathoms long, which you will be able to wield by the means of the magic ring on your left thumb. The spear must be as thick in the middle as a large tree, and both its ends must be sharp. In the middle of the spear you must have two strong chains, ten fathoms in length. As soon as the dragon has made himself fast on the spear, you must thrust through his jaws, and you must spring quickly from the iron horse and fasten the ends of the chains firmly to the ground with iron stakes, so that he cannot get away from them. After two or three days, the monster's strength will be so far exhausted that you will be able to come near him. Then you can put Solomon's ring upon your left thumb and give him the finishing stroke. But keep the ring on your third finger until you have come close to him so that the monster cannot see you, else he might strike you dead with his long tail. But when all is done, take care you do not lose the ring, and that no one takes it from you by cunning. The young man thanked the magician for his directions and promised he should, re should succeed to reward him. But the magician answered, I have profited so much by the wisdom the ring has taught me that I desire no other reward. Then they parted, and the youth quickly flew home through the air. After remaining in his own home some weeks, he heard people say that the terrible dragon of the north was not far off and might shortly be expected in the country. The king publicly announced that he would give his daughter in marriage, as well as a large part of the kingdom, to whoever should free the country from the monster. The youth went to the king and told him that he had good hopes of subduing the dragon, if the king would grant him all he desired for the purpose. The king willingly agreed, and the iron horse, the great spear, and the chains were all prepared as the youth requested. Then all was ready. It was found that the iron horse was so heavy that a hundred men could not move it from the spot, so the youth found there was nothing to do but to move it by his own strength by means of the magic ring. The dragon was now so near that a couple of springs that he could be over the frontier. The youth now began to consider how he should act, for if he had to push the iron horse from behind, he could not ride upon it. As the sorcerer said, he must. But a raven unexpectedly gave him this advice. Act upon the horse and push the spear against the ground, as if you are pushing off a boat from the land. Smart bird. The youth did so, and found that in this way he could move easily forward. The dragon had his monstrous jaws wide open, all ready for his expected prey. A few paces near, and man and horse would have been swallowed up by them. The youth trembled with horror, and his blood ran cold, yet he did not lose his courage. But holding the iron spear upright in his hands, he brought it down with all his might, right through the monster's lower jaw. Then, quick as lightning, he sprang up from his horse before the dragon had time to shut his mouth. A fearful clap of thunder could be heard from miles round. Now warned that the dragon's jaws had closed upon the spear. When the youth turned round, he saw the point of the spear sticking high above the dragon's upper jaw, and knew that the other end must be fastened firmly to the ground. But the dragon had got his teeth fixed on the iron horse, which was now useless. The youth now hastened to fasten down the chains to the ground by means of the enormous iron pegs which had been provided. The death struggle of the monster lasted three days and three nights. In his writhing, he beat his tail so violently against the ground that ten miles distance the earth trembled as if with an earthquake. When at length he lost his power to move his tail, the youth, with the help of the ring, took up a stone which twenty ordinary men could not have moved, and beat the dragon so hard about the head that it's very soon the monster lay lifeless before him. 
You can fancy how great the rejoicing was when the news had spread abroad that the terrible monster was dead. His conqueror was received into the city with much pomp, as if he had been the mightiest of kings. The old king did not need to urge his daughter to marry the Slayer of the Dragon. He found her already willing to bestow her hand upon this hero, who had done all alone what whole armies had tried in vain to do. In a few days, the magnificent wedding was celebrated, at which the rejoicings lasted four whole weeks. For all the neighboring kings had met together to thank the man who had freed their world from the common enemy. But everyone forgot amid the general joy that they ought to have buried the dragon's monstrous body, for it began now to have such a bad smell that no one could live in the neighborhood. And before long, the whole air was poisoned, and a pestilence broke out which destroyed many hundreds of people. In this distress, the king's son-in-law re resolved to seek help once more from the eastern magician, to whom he had once traveled through the air, like a bird by the help of the ring. But there's a proverb that says ill-gotten gains never prosper, and the prince found that the stolen ring brought him ill luck after all. The witch maiden had never rested day or nor night until she found out where her ring was. As soon as she had discovered by means of magical arts that the prince in the form of a bird was on his way to the eastern magician, she changed herself into an eagle and watched in the air until a bird she was waiting for came in sight, for she knew him at once by the ring which hung around his neck by a ribbon. And the eagle pounced upon the bird, and the moment seized him with her talons, she tore the ring from around his neck before the man in a bird shape had time to prevent her. The eagle flew down to the earth with her prey, and the two stood face to face once more in human form. Now, villain, you are in my power, cried the witch maiden. I favored you with my love, and you repaid me with treachery and theft. You stole my most precious jewel from me, and do you expect to live happily at his king's son-in-law? Now the tables have turned. You are in my power, and I will be revenged on you for your crimes. Forgive me, forgive me, cried the prince. I know too well how deeply I have wronged you, and most heartily do I repent it. The maiden answered, Your prayers and repentance come too late, and if I were to spare it, you anyone would think me a fool. You have doubly wronged me. First you scorned my love, and then you stole my ring. You must bear the punishment. With these words, she put the ring upon her left thumb and lifted the young man with her hand, one hand and walked away with him under her arm. This time, she did not take him to a splendid palace, but to a deep cave in rock, where there were chains hanging from the wall. The maid now chained the young man's hands and feet so that he could not escape. Then she said in an angry voice, Here you shall remain chained until you die. I will bring you every day enough food to prevent you from dying of hunger, and you need never hope for freedom any more. With his words, she left him. The old king and his daughter waited anxiously for many weeks for the prince's return, but no news of him arrived. The king's daughter often dreamed that her husband was going through some great suffering. Therefore, she begged her father to summon all of the enchanters and magicians that they might try to find out where the prince was, or how they could set him free. But the magicians, with all their arts, could find out nothing, except that he was still living and undergoing great suffering. But none could tell where he was to be found. At last, a celebrated magician from Finland was brought before the king, who had found out that the king's son-in-law was imprisoned in the east, not by men, but by some more powerful being. The king now sent messengers to the east to look for his son-in-law, and they by good luck met with the old magician who had interpreted the signs on King Solomon's ring, and thus possessed more wisdom than anyone else in the world. The magician soon found out what he wished to know, and pointed out the place where the prince was imprisoned, and said, He is kept there by enchantment, and cannot be set free without my help. I will therefore go with you myself. 
So they all set out, guided by birds, and after some days came to the cave where the unfortunate prince had been chained up for nearly seven years. He recognized the magician immediately, but the old man did not know him. He had grown so thin. However, he undid the chains by the help of magic and took care of the prince until he recovered and became strong enough again to travel. When he reached home, he found that the old king had died that morning, so he was now raised to the throne. And now, after his long suffering, came prosperity, which lasted to the end of his life. But he never got back the magic ring, nor has it ever been seen again by mortal eyes. Now, if you had been the prince, would you not have rather stayed with the pretty witch maiden? <laughs> Immortality with a hot witch. Yeah, I can see it. Let's see, that's three stories down. stories. <clears throat> what do you think? Should you go for a fourth? No. It depends on the country and the context. So that was Dragon of the North, and they happened to mention that the one was from Finland. You can guess where the main story was. So different regions will have them different powers. And it's not like witches can't stay young forever, too. And she was actually performing a ceremony and casting a spell to keep herself young. The fact that she had to do it monthly makes you wonder how old she actually was. But, uh, I'm sure she could recommend a monthly skin routine to... <laughs> you must bathe in a clear pool... Wash, wash your face nine times in a clear pool under the full moon. Walk around it singing. Yep. Sounds like a beauty routine. <clears throat> the next story is a hand squish and Anderson. And it's a story I'm pretty sure lots of people at least know some of. Dare I read it? <laughs> I'm going to read it anyway. Just dare I read it tonight. <laughs> Sure, I'll we'll be streaming tonight. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> so our next wonderful fairy tale is a Huntress and Anderson. At least this version. The story of the Emperor's New Clothes. And a loud asshole driving down the street. Ow, could you... Can you hear the... I guess it's a truck. Go on. Try this again. <clears throat> The 
story of the Emperor's new clothes. Many years ago, there lived an emperor who was so fond of new clothes that he spent all of his money on them in order to be beautifully dressed. He did not care about his soldiers, nor did he care about the theater. He only liked to go out walking to show off his new clothes. He had a coat for every hour of the day, and just as they say of a king, he is in the council chamber. They always said, he is in his wardrobe. In the great city in which he lived, there was always something going on. Every day, many strangers came through. One day, two impostors arrived and gave themselves out as weavers, and said that they knew how to manufacture the most beautiful cloth imaginable. Not only were the texture and pattern uncommonly beautiful, but the clothes which were made of the stuff possessed this wonderful property that they were invisible to anyone who was not fit for office, or who was unpardonably stupid. These must be indeed be splendid clothes, thought the Emperor. If I had them on, I could find out which of my men in this kingdom are unfit for the offices they hold. I could distinguish the wise from the stupid. Yes, this cloth must be woven for me at once. And he gave both the impostors much money so that they might begin their work. They placed two weaving looms and began to do as if they were working, but they had not the least thing on the looms. They also demanded the finest silks and best gold, which they put into their pockets, and worked with the empty looms till late into the night. I should very much like to know how far they've got on the cloth, thought the emperor. But he remembered that when he thought about it, that whoever was stupid, not fit for his office, would not be able to see it. Now he certainly believed that he had nothing to fear for himself, but he wanted first to send somebody else in order to see how stood they regard in his office. Everybody in the whole town knew what a wonderful power the cloth had, and they were all curious to see how bad or how stupid each other were. I will send my old and honored minister to the weavers, thought the emperor. He can judge best what the cloth is like, for he has intellect, and no one understands his office better than he. Now the good old minister went into the hall where the two impostors sat working at an empty weaving looms. Dear me, thought the old minister, opening his eyes wide, I can see nothing. But he did not say so. Both the impostors begged him to be so kind to step closer and asked him if it were not a beautiful texture and lovely colors. They pointed to the empty loom. And the poor old minister went forward, rubbing his eyes, but he could see nothing, <laughs> because there was nothing there. Dear, dear, he thought. Can I be stupid? I've never thought that, and nobody must know it. Can I not be fit for my office? No, I certainly must not, and cannot see the cloth. Have you nothing to say about it? said one of the men who was weaving. Oh, it is lovely, most lovely, answered the old minister, looking through his spectacles. What a texture, what colors! I will tell the emperor that it pleases me very much. Now we are delighted at that, said both the weavers. Thereupon they named the colors and explained the make of the texture. The old minister paid great attention so that he could tell the same to the emperor when he came back to him, which he did. The impostors now wanted more money, more silk, and more gold to use in their weaving. They put it all in their own pockets, and there came no threads upon the loom, but they went on as if they had before, working at the empty loom. The emperor soon sent another worthy statesman to see how the weaving was getting on, and whether the cloth would soon be finished. It was the same with him as with the first one. He looked and looked, but because there was nothing on the empty loom, he could see nothing. 
It's a beautiful piece of cloth, as the impostors, and they pointed to it and described the splendid material which there was not there. Stupid I'm not, thought the man. It must be so good office for which I cannot be fitted. It is strange, certainly, but no one must be allowed to notice it. And so he praised the cloth, which he did not see, and expressed to them his delight at the beautiful colors and the splendid texture. Yes, it is quite beautiful, he said to the emperor. Everybody in town was talking about the magnificent cloth. Now the emperor wanted to see it himself while it was still on the loom. With a great crowd of select followers, amongst whom were both the worthy statesmen who had already been there before, he went to the cunning impostors who were now weaving with all their might, but without fiber or thread. Is it not splendid? Both the statesmen who had already been there said. See, your majesty, what a beautiful texture, what colors! And then they pointed to the empty loom for they believed that the others could not see the cloth so well. What? thought the emperor. I can see nothing. This is indeed horrible. Am I stupid? Am I not fit to be emperor? That could be the most dreadful thing that could ever happen to me. Oh, it is very beautiful, he said. It has my gracious approval. And then he nodded pleasantly, and examined the empty loom, for he would not say that he could not see anything. His whole court around him looked and looked and saw no more than the others. But they said, like the emperor, Oh, it is beautiful, and they advised him to wear these new and magnificent clothes for the first time at a great procession which was soon to take place. Splendid, lovely, most beautiful, went from mouth to mouth, Everyone seemed delighted over them, but the emperor gave the impostors the title of court weavers of the emperor. <laughs> Throughout the whole of the nights before the morning on which the procession was to take place, the impostors were up and were working by the light of over sixteen candles. The people could see that they were very busy making the emperor's new clothes ready. They presented, pretended that they were taking the cloth off the doom, cut with huge scissors in the air, sewing with needles without thread, and then at last said, Now the clothing is finished. The emperor came himself with the most distinguished knights, and each impostor held up his arm, just as if he were holding something, and said, See, here are the breeches, here's the coat, and here's the cloak, and so on. Spun clothes are so comfortable that one could imagine one had nothing on at all. But that is the beauty of it. <laughs> yes, said all the knights, but they could see nothing, for there was nothing there. Will it please your majesty graciously to take off your clothes, said the impostors. Then we will put on the new clothes, before the mirror. The emperor took off all of his clothes, and the impostors placed themselves before him as if they were putting on each part of his new clothes, which was ready. And the emperor turned and bent himself in front of the mirror. How beautifully they all fit! How well they sit! said everyone. Oh, it's material! What colors! What a gorgeous suit! They're waiting outside with the canopy which your majesty is wont to have worn over to you at the procession, announced the master of ceremonies. Oh, look, I am ready, said the emperor. Doesn't it sit well? And he turned himself again in the mirror, as if his finery was all on right. The chamberlains, who were used to carry the train, put their hands near the floor as if they were lifting up the train. Then they did as if they were holding something in the air. They would not have noticed that they could not see anything. The emperor went along with the procession and under the splendid canopy, and all the people in the streets and windows said, How matchless the emperor's clothes are! The train fastened to his dress! How beautifully it hangs! <laughs> no one wished 
to be noticed that they could not see anything, for then he would have been unfit for his office, or else very stupid. None of the emperor's clothes had met with such approval as these had. But he has nothing on, said a little child at last. <laughs> Just listen to the innocent child, said the father, and each one whispered to his neighbor what the child had said. But he has nothing on, the whole of the people called out at last. This struck the emperor, for it seemed to him as if they were right. But he thought to himself, oh, I must go on with the procession now. And the chamberlains walked along with more uprightly holding up of the train, which was not there at all. <laughs> He's got nothing on! <laughs> <clears throat> Kids. They're the only ones who are ever honest. Even when you don't want them to be. <sighs> but I like the fact that he continued on with his parade afterwards. <laughs> Well, I'm going to live a lie. I'm going to live a lie. <laughs> mm, yes, kids are brutally honest. Uh, but that's what makes them kids. And you think kids have better imagination than adults do. It's only 10.30. Hmm, this next one I haven't read before. I wonder if I read one of the variations. Let's see, how long was this next one? Ooh, the next one is a longer story. This next story is... Well, it's... Not really that long, I guess. It's only eight pages. So one more story. That strange this actual story that I don't think I've read before. Unless I start reading it, then I start noticing what other story it goes by. on this one. Yeah, especially if it's you. <clears throat> and apparently it's... Okay. <laughs> Grab strength to do modesty. Okay. So, what's this? Fifth story? I think so. <clears throat> So fifth story for this wonderful Friday Night of Fairy Tales. The Golden Crab. Once upon a time, there was a fisherman who had a wife and three children. Every morning he used to go out fishing, and whatever fish he caught, he sold to the king. One day, among the other fishes, he caught a golden crab. When he came home, he put all the fishes together in a great dish, but he kept the crab separate because it shone so beautifully and placed it up on a high shelf in the cupboard. Now, while the old woman, his wife, was cleaning the fish and had tucked up her gown so that her feet were visible, she suddenly heard a voice which said, Get down, let down thy petticoat. Let's, let's let the feet be seen. She turned around in surprise, 
And then she saw the little creature, the golden crab. What? You speak? Can you, you ridiculous crab? She said, for she was not quite pleased at the crab's remarks. Then she took him up and placed him on a dish. When her husband came home and they sat down to dinner, she present, presently heard the little crab's voice saying, Give me some too. They were all very much surprised. But they gave him something to eat. And when the old man came to take away the plate which had contained the crab's dinner, he found it full of gold. And the same thing happened every day, and he soon became very fond of the crab. One day the crab said to the fisherman's wife, Go to the king and tell him I wish to marry his younger daughter. <laughs> the old woman went accordingly, and laid the matter before the king, who <laughs> laughed a little at the notion of his daughter marrying a crab. But he did not decline the proposal altogether, because he was such a prudent monarch, and he knew that the crab was likely to be a prince in disguise. He said, therefore, to the fisherman's wife, Go home, old woman, and tell the crab that I will give him my daughter if by tomorrow morning he can build a wall in front of my castle, much higher than my tower, upon which all the flowers in the world must grow and bloom. The fisherman's wife went home and gave the message. Then the crab gave her a golden rod and said, Go and strike this rod three times upon the ground in the place where the king showed you, and tomorrow morning the wall will be there. The old woman did so, and went away again. The next morning, when the king awoke, what do you think he saw? The wall stood there before his eyes, exactly as he had bespoken it. Then the old woman went back to the king and said to him, Your majesty's orders have been fulfilled. That is all very well, said the king. But I cannot give away my daughter until there stands in front of my palace a garden in which... There are three fountains, of which must first play gold, second diamonds, and the third brilliance. So the old woman had to strike again three times upon the ground with a rod, and the next morning the garden was there. The king now gave his consent, and the wedding was fixed for the very next day. <laughs> then the crab said to the old fisherman, now take this rod and go and knock on it with a certain mountain. Then a man will come out and ask you what you wish for. Answer him thus. Your master, the king, has sent me to tell you that you must send him the golden garment that is like the sun. Am I missing a page? Nope. Hmm. Make him give you, besides, the queenly robes of gold and precious stones, which are the like flowery meadows. And bring them both to me, and bring me also a golden cushion. The old man went and did his errand. When he had brought the precious robes, the crab put on the golden garment, and then crept upon the gold cushion. And in this way the fisherman carried him to the castle, where the crab presented the other garments to his bride. Now the ceremony took place, and when the married pair were alone together, the crab made himself known to his young wife. And he told her how he was the son of the greatest king in the world, and how he was enchanted, so that he became a crab by day, and was only a man at night, and he could also change himself into an eagle as often as he wished. No sooner had he said this than he shook himself, and immediately became a handsome youth. But the next morning he was forced to creep back again into his crab shell. And the same thing happened every day. But the princess's affection for the crab, and the polite attention with which she behaved to him, surprised the royal family very much. They suspected some secret, but though they spied and spied, they could not discover it. Thus a year passed away, and the princess had a son, whom she called Benjamin. But her mother still thought the whole matter very strange. At last she said to the king that he ought to ask his daughter whether she would not like to have another husband instead of the crab. But when the daughter was questioned, she only answered, I am married to the crab, and only him will I have. Then the king said to her, I will not 
I will appoint a tournament in your honor, and I will invite all the princes in the world to it. And if any one of them pleases you, you shall marry him. In the evening, the princess told this to the crab, who said to her, Take this rod, and go to the garden gate, and knock with it. Then a man will come out and say to you, Why have you called me, and what do you require of me? Answer him thus. Your master the king has sent me hither to tell you to send him his golden armor, and his steed, and a silver apple, and bring him down to me. The princess did so, and brought him what he desired. The following evening the prince dressed himself for the tournament. Before he went, he said to his wife, Now mind you do not say when you see me that I am a crab, for if you do this, evil will come of it. Place yourself at the window with your sisters. I will ride by and throw you the silver apple. Take it in your hand, but if they ask you who I am, say that you do not know. So saying, he kissed her, and repeated his warning once more, and went away. The princess went with her sisters to the window, and looked on at the tournament. Presently her husband rode by, and threw the apple up to her. She caught it in her hand and went with her to her room, and by and by her husband came back to her. But her father was much surprised that she did not seem to care about any of the princes. He therefore appointed a second tournament. The crab gave his wife the same directions as before, only this time the apple which he received was from the man of gold. But before the prince went to the tournament, he said to his wife, Now, I know you will be betray me today. But she swore to him that she would not tell who he was. Then he repeated his warning and went away. In the evening, while the princess, with her mother and sisters, were standing by the window, the prince suddenly galloped past on his steed and threw her the golden apple. Then her mother flew into a passion, gave her a box on the ear, and cried out, does not even that prince please you, you fool? The princess in her fright exclaimed, That is the crab himself. Her mother was still more angry because she had not been told sooner, and ran into her daughter's room, where the crab shell was still lying, took it up and threw it into the fire. Then the poor princess cried bitterly, but it was of no use. Her husband did not come back. Now we must leave the princess to return to the other person's story. One day, an old man went to the stream to dip a crust of bread he had and he was going to eat, when a dog came out of the water, snatched the bread from his hand, and ran away. The old man ran after him, but the dog reached the door and pushed it open and ran in, the old man following him. He did not overtake the dog, but he found himself above a staircase, which he descended. Then he saw before him a stately palace, and entering, he found a large hall, a table set for twelve persons. He hid himself in the hall behind a great picture, that he might see what would happen. At noon he heard a great noise, so that he trembled with fear. When he took courage to look out from behind the picture, he saw twelve eagles flying in. At this sight, his fear became still greater. The eagles flew to the basin of a fountain, and was there, and bathed themselves, when they suddenly they were changed into twelve handsome youths. Now they seated themselves at the table, and one of them took a golden goblet filled with wine, and said, A health to my father! And the other said, A health to my mother! And so the health went around. And then one of them said, A health to my dearest lady! Long may she live and well. Put a curse on the cruel mother that burnt my golden shell. And so saying, he wept bitterly. Then the youth rose from the table and went back to the great stone fountain, turned themselves into eagles again, and flew away. Then the old man went away too, returned to the light of day, and went home. Soon after, he heard that the princess was ill and that the only thing that did her good was hearing stories being told to her. And therefore went to the royal castle, obtained an audience with the princess, and told her about the strange things he had seen in an underground palace. No sooner had he finished than the princess asked him whether he could find the way back to the place. 
Oh, yes, he answered, certainly. Now she desired him to guide her there at once. The old man did so, and when they came to the palace, he hid her behind the great picture and advised her to keep quite still. And he placed himself behind the picture also. Presently, the eagles came flying in, changed themselves into young men, and in a moment the princess recognized her husband among them all and tried to come out of her hiding place. But the old man held her back. The youths seated themselves at the table. And now the prince said again, while he took up the cup of wine, A health to my dearest lady, may she live long and well, but a curse on the cruel mother that burnt my golden shell. Then the princess could restrain herself no longer, and ran forward and threw her arms around her husband. And immediately he knew her again and said, Do you remember how I told you that day that you would betray me? Now you see that I spoke truth, but all that bad time has passed. Now listen to me. I must remain enchanted for three months. Will you stay here with me till that time is over? So the princess stayed with him and said to the old man, Go back to the castle and tell my parents I'm staying here. Her parents were very much vexed with the old man who came back and told them this. But as soon as the three months of the prince's enchantment were over, he ceased to be an eagle and became a man once more. And they returned home together. Then they lived happily. And we hear the story are happier more. Okay, I have read another story like that one. It was not a crab. But seeing how, how many stories I've read, a lot of the stories do seem familiar to me. Mm. That's one of the things that I have on my throne list. There's a series of books that actually break down the classifications of folk tales and fairy tales. It's an interesting read. I kind of wish I had a copy. I've read through them before. It's pretty much just an index of stories. <clears throat> but considering I've read at least eight books of fairy tales so far. <laughs> I could not think of a decent voice for the crab, so I kind of went Sebastian on him. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 15 to 11, yeah, that'd be a pretty good time. Let's see, is anyone on that we can raid? seeing any of the other story readers on her tonight. Hmm. seeing many of anyone. What the hell? That's crazy. Uh, oh, wait. Wow, Rex is actually on. Oh, have any raid suggestions?
<laughs> I'd be tempted to raid someone who's reading another crab's treasure. You know, that's the problem. I don't see a lot of the regulars that I would raid. I don't guess I have to really read anyone though. Check one more spot. Anyone from the library? Why am I the only one in the friend group, right? <laughs> it's currently streaming. <laughs> oh, well. That's it. I don't guess I really need to read out. But uh, thank you for coming in. Let's see you and Turtle and Guilty all popping in. I'm kind of glad my, kind of glad all my sound alerts worked. Definitely have to do a gaming night so we can see how badly I can be distracted by them. Just check one more. <laughs> I like them. I think maybe I'll make that uh, bacon popcorn that I posted in the. <laughs> Discord. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for coming in. Thank you for hanging out, listening to the stories. And uh, I don't know. I might do a gaming stream sometime over the weekend. I need to take a break from writing. I'm not finished yet, but still. Yeah. Uh, have a good night.